This woman's surgeon made a big, big mistake. This is her story. Meet Rose, a Canadian fashion designer living in a big city. Late for work, she's greeted by the harsh words of Gunter, an eccentric designer and businessman in the world of fashion. You interrupted my morning. Don't you have anything to say for yourself? Uh, yeah. Turns out she was nearly in a car crash this morning. I don't want your bullshit excuses. Hmm, that didn't work. Nonetheless, Gunter continues with the presentation, revealing the premise behind his upcoming collection, Scheidenfreude. Yes, that's a real word, it's just German. It means pleasure derived from someone else's suffering and misfortune. As I said, he's eccentric. After the meeting, Rose, who's now slightly pissed off after being embarrassed in front of everyone, is seen alone at a table eating her lunch. Though, not for long, as Brad, a fashion photographer, walks up and asks her out to the after party of tonight's fashion show. No. Uh, what? Ooh, better luck next time. You can't win them all, Brad. Rose reasons that the after party is a waste of time and she'd rather let her work speak for itself than go out and network with other people. But no, no, no. Brad here is persistent and won't take anything but yes for an answer. Rose finally gives in and agrees to see him at the after party. Okay, I pull up. Okay. Woohoo, score! Eager to get back on with her lunch, she's interrupted again. This time by Chelsea, who's literally marked on IMDb as Rose's best friend. Wow, what an accomplished woman. Chelsea stands in front of the mirror, fixating over her body size. Do I look fat in these clothes? No, Chelsea. No, you do not. The two friends then engage in a conversation about vegetarianism. Classic. You're either the food or the thing eating the food. My foreshadowing spidey senses sure are tingling. I wonder if this is relevant to the main theme of this story. I guess we'll find out. After the conversation dries out, which did not take long, Chelsea asks Rose to go to the after party. Wow, that's the second person that's asked her out in the last two minutes. Didn't know Rose was such a player. You go, queen. Rose tells her that Brad had already invited her to go as his date, and she accepted. I mean, who wouldn't say yes? Have you seen Brad? Chelsea asks what Rose is planning to wear tonight. Rose tells her that she'll probably just wear what she has on right now. Chelsea laughs. Chelsea decides to pick something out for her to wear, stating that she'll look hot. For tonight's after party, damn Chelsea, you lived up to our expectations. I guess you're more than just an IMD designated best friend. You've got style. Before entering the club, she stopped by the bouncer. Let's call him Greg. Greg double checks the entrance list to see if she's on there. As he's checking the list, he lets in two dump trucks instead, without even asking their names. Is that prejudice towards women with poorly done spray on tans? I think so. Inside the club, Rose meets up with Brad. It's loud in here. Yes, Brad, you're in a club. The pair head up above the crowd and start talking. What is it you really want to do? Hmm, I guess I want to work in fashion or something. Why would you ever want to work in fashion? Ooh, not smooth. Brad is definitely not a ladies man. Rose forgives him and explains that, with fashion, you can be anybody. You can become anything. It's like armor. Rose wants to help people feel strong. Through beautiful designs and drip, Brad admires the answer and leans in for a smooch. Rose is clearly reluctant when kissing, so Brad steps back and offers to get her a drink. boy. In the meantime, Rose goes to the club's bathroom and overhears two catty women gossiping about her and Brad, unaware that she's in the stall right next to them. It's revealed in this scene that Rose lost her whole family in a car crash, it's also revealed that Chelsea is the one who told Brad to ask Rose at the party. Yikes. The harsh words of these women leave Rose crying in the stall across from them, while they eat salt with their nose, before heading back out to the party. Sus. Rose, too, heads back out to the party, still in tears. She walks up to Chelsea and asks if it's true. Oh, f I told you. What? You're supposed to be my designated best friend. What happened? I don't need any more charity from you, okay? Rose races off on her motorbike, with Chelsea just behind telling her that she was only trying to help. Ah, uh, I guess it's okay then. We forgive you- Oh, damn, Rose just got hit by a truck. First, she's late for work, and then she gets run over by a truck. Could this day get any worse? Yes. The next scene shows Rose lying on a hospital bed, covered in bruises and bandages with Chelsea by her side. She wakens, and Chelsea calls for the doctor. I'm so, so sorry, this is all my fault. Dr. Keloid, the attending physician, reveals that she was out for over a week and that there was severe damage to her face, specifically her jaw, which couldn't be fully reattached. So we had to wire it shut for now until uh, we can uh, talk about reconstruction options. How do you plan on talking about it? Her jaw is wired shut. Anyway, the doctor also reveals that the bike had punctured her abdomen, ripping out a significant portion of her intestine. Though, with a healthy diet, she'll be able to live a perfectly normal life. Mine is the fact that she doesn't have a mouth. Chelsea hands Rose a small whiteboard and a marker. I want to see is what she wrote, and the nurse begins taking off her bandages. The doctor assures her that it's all a process and there's no point worrying about the aesthetic right now. The final layer of bandage is removed and it's revealed that, while she does have a mouth, it's demonic as all hell. Her mouth is impossible to open, but at least she's ready for Halloween. After Rose breaks out in tears, Dr. Keloid offers some very helpful advice. We strongly suggest staying away from mirrors right now. Very nice. 
He tells her that she should spend the next few weeks focusing on recovery and nothing else. As the doctor leaves, Rose writes on the whiteboard again, this time exclaiming that she's a monster. You're alive, and that's the most important thing. Aw, how sweet. Rose asks about work, and Chelsea reveals that she's been fired. I guess actually getting in a car crash isn't a valid excuse for temporary leave nowadays. The two friends head back to Chelsea's apartment, and Rose is giving the lay of the land. Then Chelsea heads out to grab a few things. After she leaves, Rose takes a moment to inspect her injuries in front of the mirror. She takes off her bandages, revealing what's left of her mouth, and is left saddened and ashamed of the creature that she has become. Relatable. She sits sobbing for the next few minutes before going and making dinner. Tonight, I'll be having blended tomatoes and vegetables in a drinking tube. Scrumptious. She's used to sucking cylindrical shaped objects, but this is a whole nother animal. She immediately starts spilling her dinner all over her neck and eventually throws it up. Yuck. The next scene shows Rose on her couch, going over some of her emails. She finds an email from the Burroughs Clinic. The email has an informational video attached about transhumanism. Hey, I've heard of that before. Excuse me, it's ma'am! The video is filled with science jargon, but the basic premise is that they're offering free, though highly experimental, stem cell manipulation for those with body and facial disfigurements. Intrigued, she and Chelsea visit the clinic, where they meet with Dr. William Burroughs, the clinic's founder and head physician. He explains that they're a research facility and need human subjects for their work. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement. Rose asks if it's safe, and Dr. Burroughs tells her that they have worked with a lot of patients before, and she won't be the last. He leaves the pair to talk, and Rose tells Chelsea that she's scared. Chelsea reminds her that traditional surgery is absurdly expensive, and she doesn't have anything to lose. Then, we catch a glimpse of Dr. Burroughs' reflection as he watches from outside a one-way mirror. Spooky. We see Rose on the operating table, surrounded by surgeons wearing red silk robes. This is really starting to look more like a satanic ritual than a surgery. Nonetheless, they begin their performance and we see a translucent slab of what appears to be a jelly-like substance filled with pulsing veins placed on her cheek. And just like that, the surgery is complete. Who knew being a surgeon was that easy? Rose lays asleep on a hospital bed, covered in bandages as Brad is seen holding her hand. He leaves the room and is greeted by the doctor, asking for a moment to speak about Rose. The next scene shows the doctor watching Rose through a camera as she sleeps. That's surely a legal problem waiting to happen. While he listens to Travis Scott through the radio, we see a photo of him and his wife, and it's revealed that he too had been in a face-destroying accident, and that his wife had cancer. Rose awakens from her slumber and heads to the mirror to take off the bandages. She's ecstatic to find that her face and chest have been completely healed, and there doesn't appear to be any damage. This moment is cut short though, as her stomach growls with hunger. She leaves the room and heads to the clinic's pool, where she meets Dominic, who's bathing shirtless in the warm water. Things are heating up as she slowly walks towards him. She goes in for a kiss, Dominic pulls back as blood drips from Rose's lips. Oh, she's one of those girls. She runs away in embarrassment and confusion. In her first checkup with the doctor, she explains that she had a strange dream last night. She says it felt oddly like reality. The doctor then tells her about the symbolism behind water and dreams and how it relates to uncovering your unconsciousness. Is this guy a physician or a psychologist? Anyway, he hands her some medicine and explains that she may experience vivid hallucinations. He also hands her a red bottle and explains that it's a A super protein that's easy to digest and has been specifically designed for your nutritional requirements. It's nothing to worry about. That's a bit sussy. Rose meets Chelsea in the lobby and her friend is amazed at the transformation. In fact, the transformation was so incredible that she no longer needs glasses. Wow, talk about the future of medicine. You look so different. Yeah, a new mouth will do that to you. The new tan doesn't hurt either. The next scene shows Chelsea heading off for work as Rose sits on the counter admiring her new face through a small mirror. Rose actually doesn't have anything else to do with her life right now, considering, you know, she got fired. Jesus, Rose. You're the only person I know who gets time off and wants to work. Hashtag Sigma male entrepreneur grind set. Chelsea leaves her work and suddenly she hears someone knocking at the door. Looking through the peephole, we see Brad looking as beautiful as ever. She opens the door, revealing him holding a bouquet of flowers. He's just as stunned at the transformation as everyone else and knows that it's like nothing ever happened. No, it's not like it never happened. You good, Russ? Why are your eyes wilding out like that? Come on, Brad. You can do better than this. He offers to make it up to her by taking her out to dinner tonight, but... I'm busy tonight. Ooh, unlucky again. You can't win them all, Brad. He offers to take her out the next night, but again, she's busy. What a busy, busy woman. She takes the bouquet from his hand before closing the door in his face. Yikes. Later that night, she and Chelsea head out to the city. Hey. Good evening, ladies. Now that she doesn't look like an overcooked block of cheese, she gets in. On their way in, they walk past Gunter on his way out. He notices her through the corner of his eye and compliments her dress. I am impressed. The drip has him shook. Gunter offers her a position to work on the upcoming Schadenfreude collection. She starts on Monday. Gunter also reminds Chelsea of her photo shoot on Monday and tells her, no drinking in the club tonight. I don't want you getting fat. Based. Then we proceed with a montage of dancing and drinking. Love that. Later, we see Rose leading a man away to a secluded location. She pulls his shirt off, though things get a little strange as Rose cuts his chest open. Just another dream. 
She wakes up the next morning and has a refreshing sip of the bottle the doctor gave her. Remember Dominic? The guy that rose bit at the swimming pool? The next scene shows him on the set of a TV show. The director has an idea and brings on another actor who's playing the role of a new doctor. Suddenly, Dominic starts wilding out and attacks a new actor, strangling and ripping his face off with his teeth. He's very angry. It's a real shame they didn't catch all that on camera. In the next scene, we see Rose in her apartment. Her stomach rumbles loudly, so she heads to the kitchen to find a midnight snack. Now I know you've all been there too. Before she has a chance to open the container of medicine, she falls onto the ground in agony. She screams for a moment as her body convulses before finally passing out. She wakens a few hours later and heads to the fridge for a bottle of the doctor's special juice. Still not satisfied, she scrummages through the fridge for a few moments before locking eyes on a nice slab of raw steak. But rather than cooking it, she just drinks its yum yum juice. Yeah, bad idea. She reaches for the medicine and reads a warning label. May cause vivid hallucinations. Hey, sounds good to me. Then, we cut to Billy, a drunken bloke getting kicked out of a bar late at night. He spots a young girl outside the bar and asks for her name. Since he's not a Chad, she walks away. He retaliates by shouting mean words at her. And I thought Brad wasn't good with women. As he makes his way down the street, we see Rose behind him. The man approaches his car, but then, Rose pops up in front of him. Jesus Christ, lady, you trying to give me a heart attack? Yep. She asks him for a ride. Anywhere you want to go, Tuts. Unfortunately for him, that's not all she wanted. She grabs his hand and bites his fingers. But he's kind of into it. Though, things quickly turn sour as she bites his face off. She wakes up and rushes to the mirror to find her mouth covered in blood. Shit is starting to hit the fan. Next up, we transition to a dimly lit hospital, where the attending nurse goes to check up on a patient that recently underwent reconstructive surgery. The nurse approaches the patient and sees him taking his bandages off. Then, the patient turns around and attacks the nurse. And the following scene looks like something straight out of a 1970s horror movie. Back to Rose, we see her at the doctor's office for a routine checkup. She talks to him about her insatiable cravings for blood and the dreams that she's been having. The doctor assures her that they're just that, dreams, and there isn't anything to worry about. After all, doesn't everyone have dreams of eating people alive? Just me? Damn. Some time passes and Rose is back at work, for the first time in months. She arrives late, typical, but it doesn't seem to bother Gunter this time. With her are her most recent designs and Gunter is very impressed. He tells her to build and design one of them with him for his upcoming collection. He describes her designs as the essence of his collection. Way to go, Rose. Making your way up the industry ladder without having to get on your knees. Very cool. Back to the hospital, we see an official from the Center for Disease Control along with a police officer. One of the nurses explains to the official that they just received their first reported case of what appears to be a mutated and hyperactive strain of rabies. The patient of the first case is none other than Dominic Danvers, the television actor. Dominic is seen strapped down to a hospital bed with foam spewing from his mouth. Meanwhile at the office, we see Rose has been slaving away on her new design. Then, Brad comes up to her in what is his, what, fifth attempt to shoot a shot? Come on, man. Brad asks if she's feeling okay, and she assures him that she's totally fine. I think she's lying. She tells him that she just needs to eat, so he asks her out to dinner. That evening, the two lovebirds go out to a nice restaurant. Rose explains that she's always hungry, but can't seem to pacify the excitement of her stomach. She also explains that she's been having nightmares lately, and how they feel so real. He leans his hand towards her face and caresses her before she runs off to the bathroom in pain. Damn, come on, it's not that bad. In the bathroom, she looks in the mirror and sees all sorts of sharp teeth growing from her lips and snake-like creatures under her tongue. She heads back to the table and apologizes to Brad, stating that she needs to go home. Hey, does anyone else see that fast approaching man sprinting towards the window? This bloodthirsty unit smashes through the glass window, attacking Rose while being held back by Brad. Brad, Rose's simp, defends her honor by smashing a fire extinguisher into the guy's skull. This puts him into a gentle slumber. Checking back in at the hospital, we see that the CDC official and a nurse are standing over another victim of the mutated, hyperactive, and aggressive rabies. The official, Dr. Riley, elucidates the new strand of rabies to the nurse, explaining that they have an epidemic on their hands, unlike anything they've ever seen before. Huh, that sounds familiar. As they talk about the situation and plan how to remedy it, a rabid patient charges towards them. The two police officers on the scene unload, causing him to fall to the ground due to death. Christmas is cancelled. Cutting back to Rose, we catch her screaming in pain as she stumbles across a back alley. An old man offers his help, but Rose transforms into a massive monster and attacks the man mercilessly. Just his luck. The old man screams in terror before we fade to a hallucination, where Rose is having her face bandaged up by a group of seizing nurses. She stands up and we can see her newest fashion design for the Scheud and Froda collection. Stunning. Yes, that's really hard to say by the way. She wakens in her apartment and immediately calls Dr. Burroughs. She explains her deteriorating situation and we see her drop his special juice bottle onto the ground, smashing it and revealing thick red cranberry juice. I'm shocked. Back at the fashion studio, we see Chelsea modeling some of Rose's new designs with Brad snapping the photos. Chelsea asks what's going on between Rose and Brad and she explains that they went on a date last night. You went on a date with Brad and you didn't even tell me? What else are you hiding from me? Yeah, 
What else could she be hiding? Brad comes over and asks her what happened last night. She tells him that the medication she's on is making her a little messed up. A little bit of an understatement, but okay. She explains that she doesn't even remember how she got home after the restaurant, and Brad tells her that he took her. Strange. Before they can continue their conversation, Gunter calls Rose over for her opinion on one of her designs. It's good. She examines the piece and tears off a fair amount of the fabric, leaving the dress ragged and cut up. Now this is fashion. Gunter applauds her, and Chelsea goes onto the platform to model it. The rest of the models line up, and Gunter concludes that Rose's design will close the show. Well done. While things are looking great within the fashion studio, just outside, the city is falling apart. The CDC declares that the rabies outbreak is an emergency, warning anyone and everyone with flu-like symptoms to seek immediate medical attention. Though, this public health crisis is obviously not going to stop fashion. Gunter and his team intend to still launch their new collection, because fashion doesn't stop for anybody. We see Gunter continuing to make a fool of himself in front of a reporter, before being ushered away by his assistant. Later at the fashion show, Rose enters backstage. We see dozens of people sipping on champagne. Rose asks around, looking for Chelsea. Oh, never mind. Suddenly, her phone rings and she picks up to hear Dr. Bro's voice. He advises her to come back into the clinic for an extended stay after looking over her recent test results. Nothing serious, he claims, but you can never trust these doctors. He asks her to come in tonight, but she can't. She tells him that she'll come tomorrow morning instead. The call concludes and Chelsea pulls up in tears. She takes someone else's drink and downs a whole glass of it. She exclaims that she hates this city sometimes and that she had to take the subway because of traffic. And down in the subway, some crazy old lady went insane and bit her hand before getting shot by the police. I didn't know it would be this hot. Relatable. She makes her way to the makeup stand and nearly throws up after drinking some water. After pulling up the piece of fabric covering her wrists, we see the gruesome bite mark from the crazy lady. Yikes. She does not look like she's having a fun time. Rose leaves the backstage room to call Chelsea, only to be taken to voicemail. Suddenly, her stomach starts growling as she falls to the ground in pain, screaming. Two men overhear her screams and then start recording her. Chelsea pleads for their help before a tentacle pops out of her ribcage and pulls the throat out of one of the men's necks. All she needed was a helping hand, but these men gave her their necks instead. Very kind. The other guy, still recording, is tapped on the back by Brad, and then gently tapped on the face with his fist. Brad covers the wriggling tentacle in his jacket before injecting Rose with a mysterious needle. Wait, what? Brad's a double agent? Later, Rose wakes up backstage and her little tentacle makes its way back into her ribs. We can see that she's clearly unaware of her surroundings as she carelessly bumps into Brad. He tells her that she shouldn't be standing up so soon, and Rose asks what happened. Brad insists that she goes to the clinic, but Rose needs to see her dress close the show. Priorities, am I right? Rose finds Chelsea waiting behind the catwalk and talk about how they've always dreamed about Chelsea closing the show in one of Rose's dresses, and how it's finally happening. And while we're on the topic of the dress, it kind of looks like something out of Doom, to be honest. But I guess it's just the latest fashion trend. Before Rose has a chance to talk to her about the reason that she was trying to find her, Chelsea is hurried away to the stage. Oh my god, Chelsea, you're so sweaty. Moist. And thus, the show begins. The first few models make their way down the catwalk as Rose and Gunter soak in the glory of their accomplishment. Wowzers, I wish I looked like that guy. Buff and sparkly. Just like in the Twilight movie. One of the models, on his way down the catwalk, vomits and passes out, leaving the crowd to erupt in applause. What? <laughs> then, one of the models screams from backstage before crawling out onto the catwalk. Chelsea follows, with her mouth covered in blood, attacking everyone that stands in her way. She violently pounces on Gunter, ripping his face off. I kinda like that guy. More rabid people come out from backstage as military soldiers start unloading magazines into their chests. Chelsea, having just finished her meal, stands up proudly as the soldiers tell her to freeze. A glimpse of humanity is seen in her eyes, but it's too late and she too is shot to the ground. Rose rushes in as tears fall from her eyes. Brad pulls her away from Chelsea's body and drives her to the clinic where they meet with Dr. Burroughs. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. Me, watching this movie. The doctor leads her down the long halls of the clinic as he monologues about death and how his research is the cure that the world needs. Rose, if you could save those people, if you could stop that, <sighs> would you do it? He opens a door and tells her that that cure is just inside. Rose and Brad are led into a dim red room as the door behind them is locked. We should fill Rose in, shouldn't we, Mr. Hart? Time to come clean, as you put it. Oh my god. The doctor reveals that he employed Brad to keep an eye on Rose outside of the facility. Brad begs her to forgive him, saying that he was just trying to protect her. I love you. I don't believe you. Ooh, unlucky. You can't win them all, Brad. Then, he smashes into the glass window separating them and Dr. Burroughs. However, just as he does this, the doctor presses a button and a bucket of blood is poured onto Brad. Rose collapses to the ground as her stomach growls. The doctor reveals that they were not hallucinations and that there truly is a monster inside of her that must be let out. Brad carelessly walks backwards in complete disbelief of what he's witnessing, but he walks back a little too far as a creature from the wall reaches its arm out and attacks Brad. Fortunately, the doctor provides some much needed exposition and explains that the creature is his wife, the foundation of all his research. 
He explains that while they saved her flesh, the cancer itself within her body became immortal. Meanwhile, Rose can no longer control herself as her little chest tentacle reaches out into Brad's throat, though her humanity is too strong. She grabs a knife, and while I have absolutely no idea where she grabbed it from, she uses it to cut off her tentacle, killing it and saving Brad. Unfortunately, it's too late. As Brad's life has already left his body, Rose turns around, filled with anger, and plunges the knife straight into the monster's chest. Rose has had enough of the doctor and decides to stop his research completely. She puts the knife to her throat and decides to go to heaven, or probably hell. She falls to the ground, covered in blood, right next to her Brad. She convulses for a moment before falling forever into a deep sleep. Ha, <laughs> psych! She's immortal, remember? You can't kill someone that can't die, doofus. And that is how the cookie crumbles. Hope you enjoyed the video.